Hi everybody, Richard Ells here from Electronium. Very exciting update for you. We've just had a fork in our blockchain. It's been planned for a very long time. We started work on this fork uh, in November uh, 2018. Lots and lots of work has gone into it and it does some very exciting things. Okay, so a 51% attack is a particularly scary thing in cryptocurrency terms. It's probably the biggest threat to cryptocurrency. And certainly it's a very fearful thing from both owners of cryptocurrency and people that are being introduced to cryptocurrency. Uh, just at the beginning of this year, so uh, I think it was January 2019, we saw Ethereum Classic 51% attacked. And effectively what it means is that uh, a majority of the hashing power of the network is taken control of by somebody, so more than 51% attack, or more than 50% of the hashing power of the network, which I'll explain in a moment, is taken control of by someone. And by doing that, it gives them an ability to do something nasty. Normally, it's a, it's a double spend, so it means that they get to spend coins twice, and then the loser of that will be the exchange. So nobody wants to see that in their cryptocurrency project. It's, it's a really, really bad thing, and uh, obviously, when you start seeing relatively large branded cryptocurrencies having this problem. It's a, it's a scary thing. So I'm very pleased to report that our new fork that we've just taken place means Electronium is not susceptible to 51% attack. We're in a very, very, very small minority of cryptocurrencies that can say that. We are perfectly safe from 51% attacks from now. Okay, so a few times in this video, I'm referring to hashing power. Uh, what I need to point out is that hashing power of a network and actually completing the block template, submitting a block and managing the blockchain are two different things. So when you hear of hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin miners, for instance, the word miner is perhaps a little bit of a misnomer. They are not actually managing uh, a, a, a Bitcoin node. They're not actually submitting a block template and they're never actually solving a block template themselves. What they are doing is they're being given by a, a pool, a Bitcoin mining pool. They are being given a, a mathematical problem to solve and they're using massive uh, co computational power, perhaps a, one of these warehouses you may have seen full of loads and loads of racks of servers. They are trying to solve a little mathematical problem. Now that mathematical problem is just there under a protocol called proof of work. It just proves that you are a real person effectively. It proves that you genuinely are part of the network. Now, originally, when the, when the algorithm was first written, the idea was that you ran a Bitcoin node and you mined. So everybody that was a miner was actually part of the network. But then what happened is pools came along. And this was a great invention because the idea was that actually you might work for so long, you might work for three or four months without managing to solve a block yourself. And that became disheartening because you didn't get any reward. So a pool came along and people provided their hashing power to the pool and then when they solve a block the bitcoin that they got was distributed fairly amongst all the people that provided the computational power to solve this equation but the important part i'm finally getting to is that actually all the transactions on the bitcoin network go through the pool they go through the pools node not to the people that are mining bitcoin so because the pool is getting them and there are only about 20 of these pools on the bitcoin network that are responsible for maybe 99 percent of, of all mined bitcoin what it means is that 20 odd organizations are handling all of bitcoin's transactions so in terms of your uh, distribution in terms of how many nodes do you need to run to maintain good transactional systems the number is nowhere near as large as you might think it is Okay, so one of the things we've done in this uh, blockchain fork is we have done a massive uh, reduction in the block reward. We have smashed it down by 75%. So now every time a block is mined in ETN, there is 75% less ETN emitted. Now we've done that for a number of reasons, but the biggest reason is the longevity of the product. Uh, we, we, um, when we designed it in the very first place, we wanted a high block reward because we wanted to encourage hashing power into our network. That hashing power is no longer anywhere near, well, we don't, it's not required by our network anymore. And because it's not required, we can reduce the block reward, which gives us longevity. Okay, so whilst we are still using the fundamental algorithm of proof of work, we are no longer a proof of work cryptocurrency. So we have coined this phrase proof of responsibility. 
because the proof of work algorithm is no longer requiring massive hashing power. So we've tweaked it, and I'll explain that in a moment uh, as well. But, but effectively, this, this phrase proof of responsibility is because what we're trying to do is proof of work was all about proving that you're a real person effectively, which enabled you to become part of a blockchain. Well, the way we're working now, we know who it is that are doing the mining. So because we know who it is that's doing the mining and they are responsible parties, we've coined this phrase proof of responsibility. Okay, so uh, we have created something new here. Uh, we now have a phrase that we've coined as well for this. We, we, we are running now a moderated blockchain. So we looked at lot, lots of different models before we started working on what we've now just forked to. Uh, we looked at federated blockchains and we looked at private blockchains and uh, permissioned-based blockchains. But there was no real model in the market that suited exactly what we needed. So we needed to have uh, protection against 51% attack. That was a very critical thing that uh, we had had from some partners that, uh, that effectively were, were scared of the crypto world and we want to make sure that we smoothed that away. But also we wanted to make sure that, so our security is good, we wanted to make sure our scaling capabilities are, are good as well. And all of this came into this situation where there was nothing in the market that was quite right for us. So we've made this new thing that we call moderated blockchain. So what is that? We have the decentralized layer of the people that are actually mining. So these people that are mining and managing the ETN network are running largely like they were before in terms of the actual transactions, in terms of the underlying algorithm is, is largely the same. But what we've got now is we've got this uh, layer that we run internally, so it's a centralized layer, but it is moderating the decentralized layer. So what we have is we have a redundant array of highly trusted moderator nodes. And what they do is they look at the network. So they watch the blockchain network, which gets on with its job. Now, as it is, the partners that are running, the people that are running the, the, the miners now are trusted. They are responsible people. So this is where uh, the, the phrase proof of responsibility came from, and we'll cover who the miners are in a moment. But the people that are running that mining layer probably will never need any kind of, uh, uh, of moderation, really, because they're responsible. However, what you have to think about in blockchain is attack vectors. So what we've looked at is, okay, well, if somebody was to, uh, to take control of their software, so they actually managed to hack in and steal their software, they'd have to do two things, actually. They'd have to steal their software, and they would have to steal an authorization key. So if they managed to get those two things, then uh, somebody outside of our trusted network would be able to mine some ETM blocks. Now, what's great is they wouldn't be able to go crazy and mine loads and loads of blocks in a row because we've added something else, which is you can no longer mine uh, two blocks in a row with the same key. So you have to mine alternate blocks uh, or, or, or further on, but certainly you can't mine two blocks in a row. So that means that this, this attack vector has now been made even more difficult because you've also, you'd have to hack into another one of the miners, steal their software and their key, and now you could mine alternate blocks quickly. At which point, our moderator nodes now become into their own. So at that point, they'd say there is unusual activity on our blockchain, and within seconds, we can shut those off. So the rest of the network would still carry on, uh, but those two particular nodes would be shut down. So our moderator nodes, the highly trusted moderator nodes, are there to just police the network. And uh, we've tested this a great deal internally. It's working extremely well. It basically, from, the, from a public perspective, it's identical. Nobody takes any notice. It's completely transparent to the end user. But from a security point of view, it's massively enhanced the security of Electronium, which is a fantastic thing. OK, so who is now mining uh, Electronium? Who, who is now responsible for that layer of the decentralized part of the Electronium blockchain? Well, the answer is NGOs and charities. So when I spoke earlier about proof of work going into proof of responsibility, what we've done is we've targeted responsible organizations and we have reached out to them and we've explained what we're doing and how they can become involved in this project. So we've got uh, 20, 25 of these people that are either over the line already or in negotiation. Uh, we'll have plenty of, of network redundancy in terms of, uh, of how many of these people there are, and we will be growing it over time. 
Now, we've deliberately targeted them to be in the same regions that we are growing ourselves. So everywhere that we're targeting, we've looked for NGO or charity partnerships. And what that means is that these guys get the direct benefit of the block reward. Now, initially, I'm sure that they will be just taking that block reward and thinking, well, what do I do with ETN? Well, their first option, and certainly the option that we've said to them is relatively easy to achieve, is cash some of that ETN and turn it into US dollars for your project. Now, as they do this month in, month out, they will start to realize something. They will start to realize that cryptocurrency is real. Cryptocurrency is something that can actually benefit their users on the ground. I'm not too sure the NGOs call them users, but the people that they're trying to help it, uh, are, are, are directly benefiting from ETN. So if we're approaching uh, the people on the ground from one side and the NGOs that are supporting the same people are using ETN, even if they're just cashing it for US dollars to start with, then suddenly the synergy becomes really, really important. And when they realize that actually they can spend some of that ETN themselves, they could, they could buy gigs on the gig economy themselves, for instance, they could, they could reward people on the ground themselves. They could enable someone to, to, for instance, they could pay the guy who is, who is doing some work for them in ETN, knowing that he could top up his phone and get his family's phone topped up. And often knowing that the underlying airtime and data has, has a, a value in those regions as well. So, so that by, by synergistically partnering with, uh, with NGOs and charities, we have uh, enabled the block reward to be used within the Electronium project not by us, but by people that have synergy with us. And it's a really important step. So I think that this is going to be something I'll, I'll talk about more, and I'm sure uh, more will come out on our social. But this is a really uh, exciting step for us to be partnered with responsible agents who are going to be maintaining our blockchain for us. OK, so we're going to be going live with uh, 15, 20, 25 NGOs. And uh, one of the things I think people might be thinking about is, ooh, that doesn't sound like many people mining the network and maintaining the transactional system of ETN. But I just wanted to point out, because I think there's a, a misconception in the market, that there are hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin miners. Well, there are hundreds of thousands of people producing proof of work uh, mathematical calculations for the Bitcoin network, but that has literally nothing to do with the blockchain uh, transactions. The blockchain transactions are put together by the pools, Bitcoin pools, and 99% of all transactions on Bitcoin are, are probably in less than, but certainly no more than 20 pools. So there are actually only 20 uh, nodes running on the Bitcoin network that handle 99% of the transactions. So in terms of transactional numbers, you've got absolutely nothing to worry about by our what's seemingly relatively low numbers. What's more important is that we have absolute trust of the responsibility of the people that are maintaining our decentralized layer. So we're in a very, very good position. And that will grow over time as well as we partner with more people uh, around the world that are responsible parties. OK, so we are not, we're not publishing a list of which NGOs are mining uh, on our decentralized layer. Uh, we are allowing, it, uh, we're allowing them to, to talk about it when they're ready. So remember that from, uh, from a whole cryptocurrency sphere perspective, as well as from the Electronium perspective, we're trying to get NGOs and charities over the line of understanding that cryptocurrencies can be very beneficial to the same people that they are trying to help themselves. So by getting them involved in the cryptocurrency space, it's a massive move forward, it's not just for electronic, but for cryptocurrency in general. Now, I know a few of them will, will uh, come forwards very quickly and, uh, and say, oh, yeah, we're, we're mining electronium and we're going to be using the, the dollars that we raise to, to aid their projects. And, uh, and I'm sure at some stage we'll, we'll get them using some electronium directly as well. But, uh, but from our perspective, we're not going to publish a list out and out, here's who's doing it. You'll see more and more come forwards over time. Now, from our perspective, we, we had to say to them, you can keep this as anonymous as you want. Because from their perspective, it may take a month. They might, they might get some ETN in the first month and, and cash it in for dollars and think, hey, they, that was really easy. Or they, they may take six months before they go, do you know what, this electronium is real. Cryptocurrency is real, it's tangible, it's helping people on the ground. At some point, you'll get them over the line to, for, the, for, the, for their group think to think cryptocurrency is making a difference to the planet. So at that point, you'll see more and more people coming forwards. Now, one thing that we've now got on our blockchain that we didn't have before is every single block that gets added gets signed. 
So those of you who are more technical, you'll be able to look on the blockchain and see the different signature numbers and you'll know how many people there are out there uh, mining electronium at any one time. Now what we are going to do at some stage in the future is we're going to change our block explorer to actually put the signature next to the block so you can see which signature becomes a bit much easier, you wouldn't need to be as technical to be able to see how many uh, miners there are. And later, as somebody comes forward, so as a, a, an NGO or a charity comes forwards and says, actually, I'm mining Electronium, we will always retweet that, by the way. Uh, we'll, we'll monitor the, the social channels of, uh, of the NGOs and charities. Is if they make any mention of Electronium, we'll make sure we get it out onto our social to, to spread the word. But at the same time, what we will offer them is once they come forwards, we would then get their logo and their brand and stick it into our Block Explorer to say who it was that mined that block and put a little shout out to the NGO or to the charity so that our Electronium users understand who it is that's mining and our uh, charities and NGOs also get a little bit of, uh, of symbiotic uh, brand enhancement at the same time. So uh, what have we got to take away from today's video? Uh, we have coined the phrases moderated blockchain. So Electronium is now a moderated blockchain. We are no longer responsible for proof of work. So this huge electricity waste is now gone from our blockchain. We are now using proof of responsibility. This is some other phrase that we have coined because it makes more sense in the blockchain world uh, you know, everybody worries about environmental impact, so we wanted to make sure we solve that problem, and we have. Now, we are no longer susceptible to 51% attacks. That's absolutely critical. So we now have an extremely secure blockchain. And remember, we have that layer of moderator nodes that can protect us even further. So I think the thing to take away from today is this is a hugely positive step for Electronium. We have moved the whole blockchain project uh, in leaps and bounds. Uh, and uh, effectively, uh, it's opened the door for the future in terms of scalability and lots, lots more. So uh, watch this space as always. Thank you very much for taking your time to watch this. If you've got any questions, drop them onto the, uh, to the community forum. We'll answer them uh, whenever we can. I'll maybe do another video or they'll be answered on social. But do drop any questions that you have and we'll answer them. Have yourselves a cracking day. Thank you very much.